Welcome to Crestcats Live Market Call featuring our macro and activist mining research. I'm Kevin Smith, Crestcats founder and chief investment officer. Before we get started, please refer to our important, important disclosures pages on the screen now. These can also be found in the description on Crestcats YouTube channel um, and on our website. Crestcats Live Market Call is about sharing timely macro and newsworthy geologic updates both positive and negative news across our holdings as they arise. These videos represent the opinions of Crestcat as a mining and exploration industry advocate. Our objective is to share the overall geologic progress of our activist strategy in creating new economic metal deposits in viable mining jurisdictions around the world. If you enjoy our videos, please click on the like button and make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel to get notified of upcoming episodes. You can also follow Crestcat Capital on Twitter for ongoing macro research and important news updates on our positions. If you want to learn more about Crestcat's investment strategies, we encourage you to reach out to Merrick Iwahashi. His contact information is on the screen now and can be found on our website at Crestcat.net. So let's get started. Uh, today, um, or this week, we had another inflation week, another CPI week, and this has been kind of a persistent trend that we've been calling for. tavi has been particularly, uh, you know, calling for it, and that is the second wave of inflation. And and w what's the Fed been calling for? Instead, the Fed has been saying that they expect inflation to decelerate down to their 2% target. In fact, they started the year with like, you know, tipping their hand that they were thinking about six rate cuts before before the year would be over. I think that's dwindled down to something like two now because uh, it's, it's, it's much like when they were telling us that inflation would be transitory. It's like they were wrong and they're wrong and now they're being proven wrong again because inflation is not coming down towards the Fed's 2% target. It's going back the other way. It's going up. And this is super core inflation, super core CPI. It's something that the Fed looks at. And it's it's um, it's really the services, less energy, rent, and it's, it's the services, less the energy and real estate uh, components of the CPI. And on a year over year basis, it's up over it's up over five percent. And on a three month annualized basis, it was up over eight percent. Uh, with the latest CPI report this this week. So in, the inflation data is doing anything but coming down towards the Fed's 2% target. And, uh, and it's no surprise that gold and silver have been breaking out. And gold stocks are starting to move up as well. And it's very exciting to see. Let's go on to the next. So, so here's silver. Silver's had a nice run recently, but nothing like cocoa. I mean, cocoa has been on fire over, over the last year. And and I, this chart was going around Bloomberg today, and I thought just thought it was pretty interesting because it shows that long-term chart on, on silver juxtaposed right with cocoa. And it shows that Hunt Brothers cornering of the silver market back in, in, um, in 1980, uh, move in, in silver and and look and look where we are today. Um, you know this is re-indexed to one uh, to 100 as of as of 20. Well, it's indexed to 100 as of 2024. That's why the prices don't look exactly like you know the $50 level that we hit for silver in 1980 and again in the early 2000s. Um, but but silver, you know, just to get back to to its its prior highs of, of $50 an ounce. I mean. There's still a long ways to go to the upside, uh, and uh, it's just showing you, you know, like Tavi has talked about in a in a in a commodity bull market, the rotation, you know, tends to to go from one commodity to the next. In an inflationary market, it's it's the same thing. Um, you know, look at you know what the potential is here. Let's go on to the next. That's a great chart, Kevin. By the way, good good stuff. So, um, so I'm going to thank you, Todd. I'm going to talk a little bit about about uh, our our investment strategies here at, at Crestcat today. We have three hedge funds at, at Crestcat. We have a global macro fund, 
a long short equity fund and a precious metals fund. Uh, now, just this Venn diagram over here on the on the right side here tries to show kind of, kind of the relationship among these different funds because there is a lot of overlap, and and really at the center of all that overlap is our long is what today is our long resource equity positions. So our precious metals fund is is a is an activist metals fund. We have two buckets in there really our gold bucket and our electrification um, metals bucket that includes silver copper nickel and, and other base metals um, and uh, and then um, and it's an activist strategy I'm, I'm not going to go too in depth into it right now let's just talk about the big picture at Crestcat um, and then we have the long short fund which is our our long short equity fund a lot of what we do at Crestcat is equity focused um, and we, we um, you know, it's something that I, you know, have, I've had an equity bias and bent now for 30 plus years. I've got an equity fundamental quant model that I originally developed 30 years ago, and we've been continuing to use it and refine it ever since to manage money. Um, uh, but we, but we're also macro. So we, we have a, a global macro fund uh, and, the, and um, it's really, um, it's really the long, it's really encompasses the long short equity fund. Plus it has the other macro exposures in other securities besides equities like fixed income securities and, and commodity futures um, that, that, um, that aren't necessary and currencies even that aren't necessarily expressed um, in the long short equity fund. So global macro fund is, has everything. Our investment process at, at, um, at Crestcat is very much macro focused as well as value focused. That's important to understand uh, in our DNA about, about who we are. Uh, but we like to express a lot of our themes through equity. So you're going to see a heavy equity bent across all of our strategies. The Global Macro Fund has long and short exposures, as says the Long Short Fund. The Precious Metals Fund is really our, our long only um, focus fund today. It can go short if it wants to, but today it, it's a long only focus fund uh, and we are long precious metals, mostly through precious metals mining stocks and heavily tilted towards the exploration side of that, which is a small cap and even some micro cap uh, exposures that we have there because that's where we believe the biggest value opportunity is to capitalize on this macro environment of rising inflation and depressed valuations. Let's go on to the next. So what we're going to look at here is the exposures that we have. This was as of the end of last month in our global macro fund because it really shows, you know, the different themes that we have. And there's there's eight different themes that we have across the firm. The global, the global macro fund is the one that can express all of the themes. And uh, so let's just walk through this a bit. We have our mega cap growth ceiling theme. And, and that is, is our shorts, our short positions in, in large cap uh, growth stocks, mostly technology stocks that score poorly in our equity fundamental quant model. Uh, and, um, and we have an, um, and this exposure is mostly through put options. We also have uh, an, S, um, an SPY put option, so an S&P 500 put as well, because we believe the we not only do we have the catalyst for a market move to the downside with rising inflation and high interest rates and the inverted yield curves, uh, but we also, and, ex, and the excessive valuations, already mentioned that, but we also have, have um, uh, we, we have both the catalyst and we have both the valuation uh, set up and and the uh and the positioning set up the the crowded positioning um so misprice cost of capital that's our other general equity bucket where we have short positions in a variety of other uh stocks that are um that are um supported by our equity fundamental model brazil liftoff is a is a long um long commodity theme with brazilian stocks uh genomic revolution that's uh, that's our biotech theme where we've got Lars Tile helping us to to pick stocks there. He's an industry expert. 
on our energy shortage theme. We've got, um, uh, you know, some long exposure there, mostly through large and mid cap uh, oil and gas stocks. And Lisa Themi is our um, our industry veteran there who's helping us with with that theme. Um, our global fiat debasement and electrification metals. That's our activist metals exposure and not, it's also its own fund in the precious metals fund just those two themes those themes are across all three of our funds it is our largest exposure across the firm today because it's both a macro and a value exposure that we have high conviction around and and so um yeah, that is why we you know, every friday here we talk about our activist metals positions and, and, and our theme um, but you can see the exposures here. This is relative to NAV in our global macro fund. So the fund does does employ a modest amount of leverage, um, but we have a heavy short position to offset our our, our long positions. Uh, and we also have a yield curve steepener trade. This is our short 30-year uh, treasury bond position that's duration matched with a long two-year note position. And... Uh, and it looks like a large exposure because most of that exposure is coming from the two-year note side, which is, you know, very short duration um, treasury securities, not super high risk. Uh, but what we're playing is the steepening of the yield curve. We've been in a record long inverted yield curve um, period of time. Normally, that's a signal of an oncoming recession. We believe this one's going to prove to be a stagflationary recession, uh, and and therefore we have this general great rotation trade where we're short mega cap growth, overvalued mega cap growth stocks. We're long commodity related equities, um, but when you go into a recession, what happens? That's when the yield curve re-steepens, re-steepens because the Fed is is forced to capitulate and start to lower interest rates. And and um, but in this case, uh, we have um, you know we also have, are still in this inflationary regime, and we think there's a lot of risk still on the long end of, of the yield curve. And so, um, lo and behold, you know, we haven't seen the recession yet. We haven't seen the uninversion, the steepening of the yield curve. We think it's directly ahead of us. And rising inflation and the lack of the ability of the Fed to 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 cut rates on on the short end um, is, we think, one of the the key drivers here. So um, that's all I have for today. Let's let's turn it over to Tavi. There we go. Found it. Sorry. Um, well, then if you could, uh, I think I sent you a pres another presentation, but if, 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 if you can't, that's fine. We'll, we'll start with this one. It's okay. Uh, I rearrange things to start with a different chart. Um, but essentially, I would like to talk a, a little bit about a few things. Notice that this chart is, is the NASDAQ 100 index adjusted by money supply. Um, and the, the whole idea of this chart is to show, yes, we're kind of living in this banana republic environment where things have been going up uh, drastically in prices, but we're not seeing um, you know, the real moving fundamentals is really driven by dilution of money. Um, and I see a lot of people that tend to be very bullish in equity markets because they see that. And I think ultimately it's going to drive the cost of capital higher with inflation actually being higher for longer and that will readjust the valuations of specialty equity markets. But the idea that this chart is really, actually, if you go back to the 1940s, I was reading an IMF paper uh, yesterday in which it was basically trying to explain what happened during the 1940s when we, re, you know, we really build up those levels of debt uh, that we had during the World War II. And how do we deleverage? And a lot of people like to talk about the inflation uh, story. Inflation was a big part of it. Running the, the economy hotter than uh, than historical standards was one of the main things that caused inflation to, uh, or I should say, to the, the deleveraging process to unfold. But there was another thing or another two things that happened during that period that I think often people forget about. Um, there was a, a, a pagging the deep or the, the pagging of the, the 10 year yields and other yields as well. We, we had a capped uh, until I think it was a two and a half percent. But 
one more thing allowed the, the government to actually cap those yields. Uh, one of them was the fact that we were in a much more disciplinary world back in those days, particularly when you look at gold being pegged relative to gold, uh, to uh, sorry, the dollar being pegged relative to gold. But the second important thing, which this paper was all about, it was really explaining how uh, the government was running a primary uh, budget surplus during that decade, in which helped the government to really, uh, you know, referring to the post World War II era, uh, which really helped the government to reduce the amount of leverage over time. A primary budget is just looking at the actual spending by the government that excludes interest payments, if you're not aware of. And so today, given the environment we're in, I mean, we're not in a post war era. I think we're at the beginning of a deglobalized environment. And it's not the very beginning. I think the beginning was in 2016, 2017, arguably, uh, with the US-China tensions that used to be mostly actually Trump's idea that kind of translating to becoming something very bipartisan. And now it's, it's got really, uh, I would say, escalated into Russia and in Ukraine. You've got what's happening in the Middle East and even Guyana and, and Venezuela and so forth. There's so many different uh, you know, political geopolitical risk actually being, um, I would say, uh, really spreading across the across the globe. But the, the the real point of that idea is that in, in today's environment of of actually entering a deglobalized environment and this need for reshoring and and re, and reducing the, the this reliance that we have currently with imports and other things is really going to be driving more and more of this fiscal dominance. How do we run a primary budget surplus in a world that strongly requires a, um, a fiscal dominance environment? It's it's going to be kind of mind boggling to me. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, this chart is is also really interesting. It's basically looking at the this new regime that I think I've I've actually get not I don't get a lot of questions. I'm not saying I get a lot of people asking me stuff, but I did have. A few people asked me a question that I think it's really important. Um, they're talking about the gold correlation versus the 10-year yield. Now, a lot of people thought that gold would never rise with 10-year yields rising. That was an impossible scenario. And others would say, no, it's not nominal rates. you got to look at real rates. And even in that basis, things have diverged, uh, you know, I would say significantly. And the real question is, are we in the same macro regime we're in back in you know, two, three decades ago? Are we enter something different? This chart is another example of that. It's basically showing you that the U.S. equity markets uh, volatility is today highly linked to inflation expectations. If you look at the, and I'm measuring this by looking at the 10 year break even rate. And you can see that the rolling correlation over the last year, uh, and I'm looking at the weekly changes of that measurement. You can see that we're at the highest level we've ever been in terms of equity volatility inflation expectation. And what does that mean? That means that if inflation expectations begin to uh, increase uh, for many reasons that Kevin was referring to, in which we're going to touch here in this presentation as well, um, most likely that's going to drive the volatility for equity markets. Most likely that's going to drive the prior chart uh, that is NASDAQ 100 relative to M2 money supply to probably also decline over time too. And so that volatility today is, is, is a concept that I don't think is, is fully understood by market participants. Let's go to the next chart. Here's another new chart. Money market funds is one of the main bullish uh, cases for the equity markets today. A lot of people like to talk about that there's a lot of money in the sidelines that could potentially drive equity markets even higher. And that is undeniable. The chart is right here. There's $6 trillion sitting on money market funds. So, Tavi, why are you bearish on NASDAQ and S&P 500? Or Kevin, why are you bearish? Because there's so much money on the sidelines. Well, like anything else in markets, I don't think we should ever be looking at things on a nominal terms. Let's go to the next chart. If you look at money market funds relative to total equity market, uh, uh, the size of the total uh, of, of the equity markets in the U.S., uh, you're going to see that it represents about 13% of the overall market. Well, back in prior bottoms, when we had a lot of money in the sidelines, because of the selling pressure that was caused, that then drove valuations to be depressed. 
uh, in 2009, Mar March of 2009 was the very bottom of the equity markets during that period. And 2002, I believe, was the very bottom for the tech bust. Um, and you can see here, we're nowhere close to those, those levels. In fact, in the tech bubble, which or the bust that was even lower peak, as you can see in this chart, it was somewhere close to 30% of how much money market funds represented of the total equity market size. And today we're about 13%. So I'm not sure, I don't think all money market funds will actually come into this to, to equity markets. In fact, historically, all the way back to the 90s, we've never seen money market funds run too much below 10%. So maybe we go back to the very low levels, which was 10%. There's three percentage points then of a potential upside. Is that really the bull case for equity markets? You know, if that's the case, I would be very uh, skeptical about that thesis. Let's go to the next chart. This next chart makes the same comparison, but instead of looking at relative to the size of the equity market, now we're looking at the size of money supply, how much money and credit is available out there. And is mar money market funds uh, that much representative of, of what it is out there? And clearly, as you can see today, we are at historical lows too. Um, compared to other bottoms that we had in equity markets, we were somewhere close to close to 50%, 45% or so of the money supply was represented by money market funds. Today, we're about half of that. In fact, we're actually going even lower uh, than prior times because of this movement uh, and, uh, uh, in, in, in money market funds, or we should say in, in the size of money supply increasing recently, in which has caused this ratio to decline as well. But nonetheless, this is just another way to show that this you know, overwhelming bullishness and all these narratives that people create sometimes is not really um, uh, driven by the data or supported by the data. And that's my role here in this case is just to show you that the data is, is really not supportive of that idea that there's not a lot of money in the sidelines. So let's go to the next chart. So next time somebody sends you a chart like that, you know, show them this chart because I think that's much more uh, a, a much better way to represent this data. Well, let's go to the next chart because I already showed this chart. Um, here's another thing that is going on in the in the in the global, or I should say, in the U.S. economy, but also in the global economy. And, and you can see this in China. You can see this in Europe. Uh, but really, in the U.S., it has the best data, more accurate data for us to measure this. It's basically looking at commercial loans, industrial uh, commercial and industrial loans in in the U.S. banks. Uh, and today, the U.S. banks put out some of the U.S. banks put out results and. We're seeing some of the negative volatility in those names, uh, but you know, more, more importantly, uh, we know that the, the banks are not lending money like they used to. Um, and you can see this by this measurement. We've been going sideways. There hasn't been much of a lending growth in commercial and industrial loans. And this is not a very bullish sign. As you can see here, back in 2017 or so, we went through that period as well, a very extended period of no lending growth that actually led to what happened in 2018, the Volmageddon, uh, a very turbulent year for equity markets. The economy had a lot of issues too. You can see the same thing happened in 2019 pre before uh, the, the COVID crash and the COVID recession that actually caused the banks uh, through the government's uh, in, in, in stimulative packages and, and, and policies really caused this number to really spike up now, recently, since the regional banking crisis, we haven't seen much lending growth. And I think this is actually quite problematic for the overall economy. Let's go to the next chart. And so now we're looking at small caps, just another ratio. We looked at NASDAQ relative to, um, uh, to money supply. Here's just another way to see the same you know, level of frothiness in markets overall. Small caps relative to NASDAQ. I mean, at Crescent, we believe there are a lot of, there's a lot of value in, in, in small caps, particularly the metals and mining names in which we tend to focus a lot more. Uh, but certainly, if you looked at from this perspective, uh, we are seeing this uh, over, um, uh, over uh, I would say, performance from NASDAQ relative to, to small caps that we haven't seen in, in, many, uh, in many decades, potentially. This chart only goes back to 1990s. But you can see here, we're now below the levels we saw back in the tech bubble. That was a time when investors should be uh, starting to allocate capital towards small caps relative to NASDAQ, although small caps also got crushed during the, um, some small caps got crushed during that environment, during the tech bust. Um, it was actually uh, a part of the market that outperformed 
uh, uh, technology companies and also NASDAQ 100. And so, you know, to me, it wouldn't surprise me if this were approaching a bottom. That's really the idea of this chart is to you know, think about historically when we see these types of divergences, or I should say not divergence, but um, uh, of, of things getting really wacky historically, you know, usually we're near a, a big shift in, in, in allocations. And it wouldn't surprise me if people start to actually emphasize small caps as a bigger part of their portfolios relative to things like NASDAQ, which has been, uh, you know, sucking most of the liquidity of equity markets and other, other, other uh, uh, parts of the uh, asset classes. Let's go to the next chart. And so well, next chart again, this is, oh, actually go back. That's actually, sorry. This is actually just looking at NASDAQ, another ratio versus commodities. I had this chart in the prior presentation. I thought I should have it again in this one. And you can see here uh, the opportunity to me and, and the reason why the opportunity is 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 really pronounced in, in hard assets is is on commodities, is, is on hard assets and real assets are really the things that are really cheap today relative to money supply once again, relative to NASDAQ, uh, relative to their own valuations throughout history. Um, Kevin showed a, a chart of, of, of silver and, 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 and cocoa, and, and that's such an important uh, a chart because we know that the structural problems in, in, those, in the commodity industries have not been fixed, meaning we're not seeing a flood of capital coming to the space uh, that is causing, uh, you know, the miners and other uh, agricultural commodity companies really enjoy and appreciate that level of capital inflows to really redeploy that capital into new supply. And, and so this is creating to me one of the best uh, scenarios for a longstanding uh, bull market for commodities that is probably going to be driven not only by the demand side that we can talk about, but also the fact that supply is likely to be very constrained moving forward. Now, you know, one thing that a lot of people do, and, and that's usually uh, what happens in, in a very speculative environment. You know, this chart is going to be a funny chart, uh, but at the same time, an important one. Uh, look for it. Let's go to the next one. And now look at this chart real quick. If if something looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a, a duck, then it might be a duck. And, and this is a funny chart looking at NASDAQ three times leverage ETF versus Bitcoin. Now, I have nothing against Bitcoin personally. Now, I do think that calling it a digital gold, a version of a hard asset like gold, I think that's that's not the right analogy at all or comparison, I should say. I think that there are better comparisons. Maybe this is the NASDAQ 300, three times leverage uh, uh, idea. Let's call it by the more proper name rather than digital gold. Digital gold is something um, that I think it's kind of misleading, number one. And number two, I, I also don't think uh, that this idea that gold has been making new highs is really overvalued at all. I've been, uh, you know, I was in an interview the other day and this guy was asking me, did he really want to know, is gold ahead of itself today? I couldn't be, I couldn't have a, a, a much, you know, I have, I have a, such a strong opinion about that topic because I, I think that gold relative to almost anything today is extremely cheap. Uh, it's it's relative to money supply to S and P five hundred to Nasdaq um, to GDP. I mean, literally all sorts of things relative to gold really historically look historically depressed. And Bitcoin's certainly not at the same level that I that I know of. And maybe this banana republic environment is 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 very positive for Bitcoin. We'll continue to see Bitcoin moving higher, and Nasdaq continues to see you know multiples that are. But I do think gravity ultimately works at some point. And if those things are linked, especially on days like today, pay attention to days like today in which we're seeing a big decline in equity markets uh, driven by technology, mega cap companies. You know, Bitcoin is also down along with NASDAQ three uh, uh, three times leverage ETF in the NASDAQ, the, the actual normal NASDAQ 100 index is also down close to 2%. So again, this is nothing against Bitcoin, but I do think that uh, there's a lot of misleading ways uh, that people are using to describe what Bitcoin really is. And to me, it's just speculation times three. Let's go to the next chart. Um, so... Another narrative that I think it's important to maybe, you know, describe here is what's happening with the Fed and, and is the Fed turning more dovish? And what are the reasons behind that? Um, I think actually Novogratz put out a good tweet, uh, which was bullish for Bitcoin, according to him. Um, he claimed that essentially 
there are no reasons why the, the Fed should be cutting interest rates. I agree 100% with his idea. I think if you looked at the data itself, there are no reasons why the Fed should be cutting interest rates. I'll go through a few charts of why inflation is actually reaccelerating. If that's the case, you know, and the Fed is actually forced to start cutting interest rates for whatever reason it is, I've been thinking a lot about it. What is what are the potential reasons? And maybe this chart right here is the main reason. Now we can talk about the political potential uh, ways to explain that type of, of of change in stance. But I think it has to do with what's happening with the the the, the debt service uh, 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 problem that the economy is facing. And when you look at the interest payments uh, that we're seeing with interest rates staying where they are, we're probably going to see uh, actually interest payments uh, run up to about $1.6 trillion, as is shown in, in this chart in the blue line that continues, the lighter blue line that continues. And if you see the projection that if the Fed cuts interest rates by about 150 basis points, you know we're going to go to actually $1.2 trillion. And so it's a 30% gap between the two. Um, so that to me is probably the main reason why the Fed is actually being forced to cut interest rates. Um, I think it's highly possible that uh, by cutting interest rates is, is probably the only way to continue to um, uh, to survive in this environment. I don't think the government is going to be able to run a fiscal a primary a budget surplus uh, anytime soon, given what's happening with the fiscal dominance and the reshoring and the green revolution and all sorts of and even defense spending that hasn't even started. Uh, to uh, to really uh, uh, come in like we saw back in the, in the 40s and 70s and 60s. And so as we see those things really uh, play a role into the, the government spending, it, this is going to become very problematic to run a potential surplus in the primary budget. And so potentially what we may see is actually the Fed having to uh, to be uh, you know, to lower interest rates on the short end because uh, that's where they have uh, the power to 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 really manipulate markets on the short end and by doing that potentially having uh, a much larger percentage of the composition of the US debt federal debt being driven by uh, T bills in which are linked to the short term rates that the Fed has uh, a handle over and so to me that's really what's the scenario going to look like this is to me it's it's an explosive environment for hard assets is is as good as it gets it's better than the prior three decades that we've had not the prior three decades but the three decades that we had in the past uh, that were uh, inflationary eras uh, the 1910s and 1940s and 1970s were nowhere close to this lack of discipline from a fiscal and monetary environment that we're in and to me, this is going to drive even further um, this commodity markets and, and other real assets. And by the way, that's not to mention what's been happening, you know, in the micro side of that I mentioned before as well, of the chronic underinvestments in commodities that is likely to also keep the supply very constrained and also the demand surging from this, you know, what I'm proposing here with suggesting that it's going to be a very uh, inflationary environment for the long term. Let's go to the next chart. And so Bank of America also had this chart. And I remember looking at this chart of, of, you know, actually by the CBO. And I had a chart here in this presentation basically showing the their guidance of how much or estimates of how much uh, the debt is a federal debt would be. And if I'm right, uh, it was basically they're expecting that we would reach to $40 trillion dollars. Uh, back in uh, in 2030s and 20, I'm sorry, 20 uh, 2040s or so. This chart is basically showing we're going to be at 40 trillion dollars by the second half of 2025. That's such an important thing to think about. As I presented in the prior uh, live presentation on Friday, I I think that the the main reason why 10 year yields are are going up is really supply driven. If it was inflation driven, you would see break evens a lot higher. I think break evens are likely to go a lot higher, but it's not yet a big driver of 10 year yields. It's not really uh, foreign central bank selling treasuries because actually foreign uh, holdings of treasuries are at record levels today. Um, and you know, to me, what's really coming down to, and it's also not default risk because CDS and uh, credit default swaps and and all sorts of things relative to uh, ten-year yields are also not explaining the this movement on the upside. I think it's really on the screen what it is. It, it's it's the flood of issuances. Let's go to the next chart. Um, 
one concept that I think it's important as well is as we see the government kind of having to uh, to work towards the situation that is highly inflationary, we have to think about that the government will likely come in with different types of subsidies in different segments of the economy. And what is important to think about this chart, which is breaking down, you know, over decades, the, the, the inflation uh, among different things, uh, you know, daycare or 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 you can look at the, the the school expenses or schooling expenses or college expenses, I should say, or medical expenses. Most of the things that the government ha, uh, you know, receives, that most of the items that actually receive government subsidies have experienced even faster inflation than the ones that are more independent. And this is such an important aspect because we're likely to see so many things that the government will probably get involved. Uh, that is probably going to be driving even further inflation to the upside. Let's go to the next chart. And so commodities are, I, I, I posted this chart recently, commodities are probably into a second wave of inflation. Uh, I think that's the case here. Um, we've had a first wave back in, in 2021, and then that peaked back when uh, Russia invaded in, in uh, Ukraine. And now we're experiencing a second wave. A lot of people are thinking this is unique. And I actually think Kevin had a very good point the other day in one of our calls, internal calls. He said this is very similar to back in 2021, not from a wave perspective, but how the Fed is behaving and calling this again. Maybe this is again transitory. And, and it's in our view, it's certainly not. I mean, it's it's a structural. Um, it, it's got lags. It's got many pillars of inflation. And it's certainly to us, it looks like it's a long term problem. Let's go to the next chart. And so here's another thing that is also interesting is that even from a, a positioning perspective, as we look at positioning for trading and other aspects of, of investing, um, we're not seeing that investors are crowded in positioning when it comes to uh, to commodities. This chart, that's kind of what it's showing. It's you know, Despite the fact we're seeing the second wave, uh, the, the positioning remains very low relative to its history. Let's go to the next chart. And so you can see even ad prices are starting to show a second wave. First wave started in 2021. Now we're seeing the second wave here and being unleashed. Now I think it's just the beginning. Uh, let's go to the next chart. Uh, this is the 10-year break-evens. And when I say that 10 years break-evens uh, have a lot more to go is, is because we, you know, if you look at this chart, we just broke out on a weekly basis on a weekly candle. And I, I think there's so much more for this to move to the upside and to retest the levels of 2021. Clearly, we've been in the last three months or so in an upper trend. The Fed seems to be ignoring this. And I, again, I don't think they're actually ignoring it. Should we rephrase what I just said? I think that the big focus is on the debt servicing problem that they don't want to mention. In fact, the main change in the Fed minutes recently was the fact that they might actually reduce the amount of QT. In other words, they're trying to improve the demand aspect of treasuries because by not buying, rebuying those, those treasuries that they are allowing them to run off and depleting those reserves over time, it's causing, an, or, or I should say, it's, it's adding to the problem of the supply issue with lower demand and, and driving yields higher. Let's go to the next chart. And so you can see oil. It's been a story that we've been covering here recently. Oil is, you know, uh, we had a, a few charts. Kevin pointed out the seasonality of energy and how energy is starting to look good. Oil companies score really well in our own models too, uh, equity models that we run here at Crescent. Um, and it's really interesting that, uh, you know, so many people used to be bullish in oil a year or two ago, and now all those folks are gone. And now recently we have seen a little bit of a change given the fact that oil prices begin to break out and people are starting to see the trend. But, um, you know, this is actually ahead of of, uh, of the break-evens and usually has a very strong correlation. So if oil continues to break out, which we think it will, uh, for two reasons, and I'll point out in a minute, uh, is, you know, we think also break-evens and inflation expectations are going to follow. Let's go to those two reasons real quick. One of them, um, well, gasoline prices also broke out. I'm not going to go through that, but basically very similar chart. It broke out recently. It probably is going to go a lot higher, but let's go to the next chart. Uh, you can see here one of the reasons is inventory shortages uh, are yet to drive the prices of oil a lot higher. And so you're looking at two lines in this case. You're looking at the inverted uh, inventories of oil in the U.S. And the white line is just the WTI prices. And so you can see clearly that there is a correlation between the two, where when inventories run low, you tend to see oil prices go higher. And now recently there is a big gap between the two, in which is driven by many things, one of them being SPRs and other things 
such as just drawing the inventories over the last months or so. But certainly there's a gap in which we think it's a bullish gap for the white line to catch up with the red line. As we see that happening, it could be driving oil prices back to the levels that we saw uh, during the Russian invasion period at $130 a barrel or so. Let's go to the next chart. The second reason is because Saudi Arabia is now running one of its highest break-even uh, prices in nearly two decades, as you can see in this chart. And that's mostly because we're accounting for the current account uh, break-even that they call, which is basically looking at how much they've been spending um, on things in general to build up their economy. And therefore, the cost of that is actually is starting to reflect on the cost to produce oil as well. And how much will uh, they have to make in order to uh, to uh, to accommodate things like increasing production of oil. And so the break-even rate of Saudi Arabia has been in an upside, and that is another thing that is likely to drive uh, the oil price much higher. Let's go to the next chart. Um, so now let's run into precious metals and finish the presentation so we can get Quentin in here as soon as possible. But basically, um, uh, here is a, a chart that I've, I've been asked the question as well of, of well, you know, do you think this is, a, no, like I said, is, is the gold market really ahead of itself? Um, there are important things that you can look at. As a trader, um, you know, we like to look at, and we're not traders, we're investors, but as a trader, I think a trader often looks at things such as positioning and, and overbought and oversold indicators. Now, I want to point out how different this environment is relative to those things. Um, who is buying probably gold is likely to be central banks. How do we know that? Well, we presented that case before. It's basically looking at the GLD ETF uh, assets under management. We're not seeing that increase uh, along with the gold prices increase. Therefore, it's not coming from the general investor. It's coming from a larger institution that is driving, driving the prices much higher from an accumulation standpoint. And so that brings to my mind is that positioning among general investors are not really driving the price. And therefore, the overbought indicators that we often like to see are probably not as, as, as relevant because when we looked at positioning itself, positioning is not extreme at all. We can look at positioning across CFTC data, looking at the future uh, uh, markets uh, through their contracts. And we don't see at all that the future contracts are at all time highs in terms of positioning. It's more like his it's a historical average over the last two decades. So that's number one. We're not seeing gold miners have a big run up yet. Now, we think we will happen. But if you look at gold miners, central banks don't buy gold miners. They buy gold. Therefore, we're not seeing, we're seeing that lagging effect across most of the miners in which we think it's a major opportunity. Um, and, uh, and so those are the important aspects going on across the gold space. And the other thing I would point out is the fact that how cheap things are. I mean, just look at silver. You know, uh, you know we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a big reversal in silver prices today. You know, that that is not to me the big attention here. The big thing is the opportunity uh, on the long term opportunity that we have in front of us, uh, and the long term opportunity is presented very well in this chart. Is is silver relative to money supply or adjusted to money supply is just now potentially forming a double bottom, and we think there's so much more uh, upside for for the metal. Uh, we know that it's been breaking out recently from you know major historical. Uh, resistances not not too long ago and we think that the upside is just getting started so for us uh you know the opportunity really is in gold but silver even more and potentially even more in the miners so let's go to the next chart so you can see here that gold prices have been rising but when you look at the gdx etf how much assets under management it has in the blue line it's historically if gold prices keep going higher and if if this is indeed the beginning of a bull market for 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 gold um you know i think that the blue line is 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 going to be one of the best ways to play this and and that's really we're yet to see that influx of capital uh from general investors into the mining industry as they start realizing that the economics of those miners have you know drastically changed with the fact that metal prices are much higher and that's you know that doesn't happen you know on 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 one day it, it, it's a process people are still understanding this is one of the most hated industries i think this is the most hated industry in the world today and if that's really the case there's so much room for a change of views from investors and as we see that happening it should drive the blue line much higher let's go to the next chart 
And so you can see junior miners. You know, I, I made a point about, you know, if central banks are really going to be turning dovish in an environment where inflation is clearly accelerating again, you know, none of us own enough hard assets. That's just an opinion, obviously. And I do think of that in, in terms of junior miners because junior miners have not moved at all yet. I mean, I think we can easily see large uh, returns in, in the near future. And so I'm really focused on this because, it, again, this is all my opinions. I, 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 I'm, I'm backed by historical data of looking at when we see a big run-ups in gold prices, usually for logical <laughs> and rational purposes, gold miners tend to do very well. And you know, the, the main part of the central thesis here is, are we in an inflationary era? And is this really a, 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 a beginning of a secular bull market for gold? I think there are many reasons why we believe that that's the case. And if, if so, I think this chart is not only at the beginning of a breakout, but it's probably going to go much higher. Again, just our views of this. Let's go to the next chart. And you can see that not just from my perspective, but looking at the data, macro data of places like India uh, that have a very good history of owning precious metals. I know gold is a bigger uh, a bigger uh, a taste for, for Indians relative to uh, silver, but we're seeing large amounts of silver imports in India recently. And this data is looking at US dollar terms and it's, it's remarkable what we're seeing in terms of accumulation of silver by India. And it's probably another important driver of the recent run-up in prices too. Let's go to the next chart. I'm almost done. Uh, this is, I think it's might be my last chart. If not, there's a, a few two charts or so, but this is such an important reminder of the case, just a simple way to explain the demand case for silver, which we get asked so many times. Um, you know, silver is an inflationary asset. People have forgotten that silver used to be a, a monetary metal and it still is, although it's an industrial metal with, or a mon monetary metal with industrial uh, properties, it does have its also properties from a monetary perspective. It used to be uh, used as 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 a as a currency in the past, and and certainly uh, it should be seen as a monetary metal today. Um, and we know that it's historically undervalued just by uh, analyzing silver prices relative to money supply. Uh, and lastly, what's been potentially a, a, another driver that didn't used to be the case is watching what's happening with the green revolution in which is using more and more of the metal over time. And as we see the breakouts in copper and other things uh, that are linked to the green, even more linked to the green revolution, it should also drive the prices of silver that is still really undervalued, even, even relative to gold prices itself. Um, and then if we go to the next chart, there's a new aspect going on, which is, you know, and I'll tie this up and, and finish, but the, you know, utilities are now uh, saying that they're bracing for a surge of power in demand. How do you think AI, artificial intelligence, and all those technology advancements are, are going to be able uh, to be as useful as people are expecting without using a massive amount of, of, of electricity over the years? And even Elon Musk actually pointed out the risk for shortages of electricity in the future drive, uh, driven by three things, really, uh, you know, the demand for electric vehicles, what we're seeing in terms of the AI revolution, but also even from a heating perspective that we're seeing, you know, places like New York forcing uh, uh, people to actually move away from uh, gas stoves to actually electrical ones. And, and all those changes are going to be uh, big drivers for um, uh, for ele electric electricity demand, uh, as we see the, this this need for revamping across most utility companies. Um, I think that that's also going to be a big driver of metals. In fact, if we go to the next chart, if you read our last letter, we talked about this construction boom, uh, which is happening already. Uh, but also, we put out you know different ways of measuring that today relative to history in which we show that certainly what we're seeing currently is, is a surge of infrastructure developments and construction, uh, mostly driven uh, by the government and, and how much they've been, you know, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act and so forth are completely dwarf other periods in history, such as uh, the rebuild of the World War II that we saw globally, uh, even inflation numbers in US dollar terms of today, uh, the numbers we're seeing are uh, really uh, uh, astonishing. And the white line here is just showing the CapEx trend that we know that is historically depressed. And so which one is, is going to give? And, and the next chart is the very last one. 
that is the final way of thinking about this. How do we go from all these policies without making the metals and mining industry at least not a margin error relative to the size of the S&P 500, in which we're seeing today a 0.4% uh, weight of the metals and mining industry in the S&P. Um, even if you go back in prior decades, we're just going back to the early 2000s in this chart. But if you go back to prior decades, we used to be double digits in terms of the weight of the metals and mining industry. And I really think we're going to go back to that. All right, this is my final chart. Now I'm going to pass it on to Quinton. He recorded a video that we want to play for you. And so let's do that now. Hello, everyone. Look, uh, I am away this week, so I'm doing this recording on Thursday evening. It's been a very exciting uh, gold market here in the past few days. In fact, just in the past couple of hours, uh, right before I made this video, I noticed gold's uh, leapt up by, by leaps and bounds. It seems almost... Uh, it's like it's going asymptotic here. It's a little spooky. It's a little Bitcoin reminiscent, you know. Uh, so hopefully it, it kind of takes a breather. It's always good to see things go up slow and steady. But wow, wow. Uh, and this slide uh, really just kind of sums up uh, kind of this, you know, breakneck speed with which the gold market, the precious metals market, and really the mining sector is starting to wake up. Um, it's really been since just before PDAC, the Friday before PDAC, when gold magically peaked up or popped up, and uh, and it's really been on a, a, a breakneck path now for what about five or six weeks of almost relentless price rise. Uh, but you know, people are waking up. People are starting to get it. They're starting to uh, you're starting to see volumes increase in in investing in mining company and so forth uh you know stocks so we're we're getting there but it's still early innings okay let's go to the next slide um one of the most interesting articles i think i've read in the wall street journal probably in the past uh 10 years it came out this past week and it talked about uh th this phenomena we're seeing of costco shoppers putting money towards buying gold bars um and Lo and behold, in this article, they they make it very clear that young people are driving this phenomena. A lot of this buying of gold bars is actually driven by younger uh, people who see the the need to hedge hedge value through acquisition of tangible gold. And I find this phenomena just absolutely riveting. I mean, you know, a lot of people have have been quite critical of millennials for various reasons, which probably mostly are completely unfounded. Um, but, you know, I, I look at this and I think, wow, I mean, these guys have it together. Uh, look at the quote at the bottom of this article here, down towards the bottom there in red. You can see, I, I want to own something physical that I can hold. Amen. Uh, I'm protecting against the situation where there is hyperinflation. What a refreshing uh, view from a, a young person. To, to hear those kind of words from uh, young people is actually, in my book, very refreshing. It tells me they've given a lot of thought to the current situation out there and the need to protect themselves. And, and you know, that is uh, an underlying thesis we've had here at Crescat. Uh, that's why we kind of invest the way we do. Uh, but it's it's now seeming to to spill over. I mean, this, this could actually, this phenomenon could actually replace some of the more recent uh, investment you know, trends that we've seen around, say, Bitcoin and other, you know, uh, non-fungible tokens and whatnot. I think, uh, like it says, I want something physical that I can hold. Yes, you want things that can hurt when you they fall on your foot, right? So uh, here we can see the gold chart, U.S. dollars. It is absolutely breaking out, and I captured it right when it hit 2373 just an hour or so ago. Uh, let, but let's go to the next slide, and let's dive in a little more here because uh really this is this is not restricted to the us okay i think we're seeing a similar phenomena maybe not necessarily explicitly younger people but in china the chinese are buying gold with both fists at this point and it's both the central bank in china but also individuals uh people are buying gold very aggressively um, once again, you know, for the 16th month in a row, according to this article, and this article is dated, this is March. Now, 
it would be 17 months because, uh, you know, Marsh, indeed, we confirmed that China continued to buy gold aggressively, if not even more so in March. But uh, 17 months in a row uh, of gold being added to Chinese uh, coffers, and that means central bank buying. Okay, that's, that is absolutely remarkable. Now, the chart over here of the gold price in Yuan, uh, unfortunately, didn't extend back to the same period. The previous chart that I showed you for the U.S., that was going back for over 20 years, almost 25 years. This chart, unfortunately, I could only get it going back about 13 years or so. But you can see just recently a, a huge, huge uh, appreciation of gold price in the yuan. Okay, where else is this happening? Go to the next slide. One of my favorite countries in the world, Japan. We're seeing the same phenomena. We are seeing, uh, you know, imports of gold into Japan tick up, and it's kind of hard to see in this chart in the lower, the lower left-hand corner here. But you can see that the darker brown bars uh, show gold imports, and then the the bars that are light on the bottom, those are gold exports. But notice that just in the past few months here, there's been a, a burst. It's a little tiny, uh, you know point on the end of that chart, but it is significant. Okay, you're starting to see the Japanese uh, import a considerable amount of gold. And when the Japanese get going with something, you know, they, they have a very, you know, culturally have a very, uh, you know, uh, herd-like approach to, to following trends. And uh, I would dare say that we could see rapid, uh, you know, importing of, of gold, purchases of gold by individuals. I do know that in Japan, it's it's uh, fairly easy for people to buy, you know, like allocate some of their salary every month to buying gold. And I think this trend is going to take off like wildfire. And why? Because the gold price, Japanese yen, has just, like, this is unprecedented, really, compared to even other currencies. This, it has absolutely skyrocketed, okay? Like, we're talking about just a, a few weeks here. It's gone from... 300,000 yen to almost 370,000 yen uh, just in a, a few weeks. Big things are happening. Uh, look, I, I'm unfortunately not listening to Tavi and Kevin speak before me, so I got to kind of solo this. Um, but um, in my view, this is a huge ground shift in the gold space. And I think it's really uh, reflective of uh, kind of a re- you know, a, a renewed appreciation for gold as uh, a means of hedging against inflation. Okay, people are are smart. They, they they're wise. People are not dumb. They're very smart, and they figured it out. Okay, all right. Now let's go to the next slide. Uh, look, last week I, I talked about the you know the flow of money into the mining space when you see a commodity rally like this, and. I talked about it in the sense that uh, this money that we'll say the green uh, dollar sign that you see is generalist money out there. Okay, this is money coming from uh, funds and, and other sources that is usually allocated elsewhere. Like it might be in tech, you know, and it's rotating now into into commodities, into mining and stuff. And you know, usually the pattern that we've seen is that it goes into the ETFs and large miners first. And then it kind of cascades down from there. And I talked about this at length last week. So I'd urge you to, if you're interested in this topic, go to last week's presentation. You can you can hear more about it. But it usually cascades down into the mid-tier miners and then into the advanced explorers, the companies that, you know, have made big discoveries that, that could be gobbled up uh, through an M&A wave um, in the not-too-distant future. And then... Uh, money even cascades down to the junior miners, the exploration companies that we we so much love here at Crestcat. And why? Because uh, that money goes into their coffers so they can go out and explore and they can make new discoveries. Okay, But it takes time. It takes time for the money to trickle down there. Now, I've decided that I have to modify my slide from last week. Why? Because of everything I just talked about in the previous three slides. So go to the next slide. And you can see uh, it's clear there's a fundamental shift in in the the we'll, we'll call it the the investment into the gold space. All right, the precious metal space. Uh, clearly, people uh, picked up on the fact that Costco is selling these gold bars. That's a lot of money, guys. I, I mean, it's hundreds of millions of dollars have gone straight into Costco 
uh, gold vending machines. That's incredible in my view. And it's a wonderful thing to see. Uh, but then, you know, look, at, I say this in jest, but then it continues on down the path. Now, I guess what I find in, intriguing here is that a lot of those people, especially those young people, millennials and, and such, who are starting to wake up to this, uh, you know, if some of them are watching this video, guess what? Uh, you can make a lot of money in the junior, minor, and ex exploration company uh, end of the spectrum, okay? There's a lot of opportunity out there. Uh, when I say make a lot of money, I should be cautious. Uh, you can, you can, uh, you know, pot potentially see, uh, you know, an increase in your personal net worth, okay, by by investing in this space, and this junior mining uh, end of the spectrum can be one of the best behaved, we'll say, the most return possible out of all of these different categories in a big gold cycle. Um, that is why we're in this, and now. It's it's a challenging area to invest. Uh, you know, you have to start to learn a lot about mining companies, junior explorers, what gold deposits are. You know, what makes them you know viable versus uneconomic, and all sorts of, of different things. Well, you know, you can do the research yourself, and I, I encourage anybody to learn as much as possible. But then there's also alternatives like looking at at Crescat. We we do the hard work. And we research companies that we think are on to major discoveries, ones that can increase, uh, you know, increase their value, increase, uh, you know, the basically by making discovery can unlock a lot of value. It's like a big treasure hunt in some ways, yes. But uh, we like to find these junior miners that are, are, we'll say, you know, at the front end of the Lasson curve where they can see multiples of return in, in theory if they make discovery okay so let's go to the next slide look i uh i've shown this slide uh, many many times uh it is my view of the gold space it shows uh basically the gold price over the past 23 years and what i've done here is i've highlighted times when we seem to be in a gold bull and it's defined by periods when the macd which is shown in the histogram down towards the bottom is, is green it's positive okay and we can see there's multiple stages here there's basically um six you know stages that have come and gone and now we're in a seventh stage over this past 23 year period what i've done here is i've shown the high the low and the high gold price for each one of those periods i've shown uh, the width of the green bar is how many months so 35 months for the one on the left uh, but you can see as an average across all of these, it's a, each, you know, we'll, we'll say 24 months on average is the duration of a gold bull in, in these cycles. And then what we see is the in the box with the green line around it is the, the multiples of increase in gold price during that, that period. Okay, so on average, we see about a 1.68x uh, increase in gold price from the low to the high. And this current bull phase that we're in, as defined by the MACD, started roughly March, so about a year ago, uh, of, of 2023. And at that time, gold was just at 1800 a little over $1,800 an ounce. If you use that average uh, multiple, that 1.68x, that would mean we, you know, we could conceivably land at about $3,026 in the not too distant future, perhaps within the next year or so. I mean, this is just looking at the odds. Uh, I would say that's that's a reasonable picture of what's going to unfold here. Now, it, it might be a longer phase. Don't know. Might might be cut a bit shorter. Don't know. Uh, but these are just your averages, and it's one way of looking at things. And I would say, uh, based on this, you know, we could have another, say, a year, perhaps even more, of uh, good gold bull uh, time in which money comes into the space we see money trickle down to those junior companies and we see them do their work and make discoveries and and more importantly we see the m a cycle also pick up where major and mid-tier gold companies start buying uh, some of these these you know newly discovered assets all right so this is where the value is created in the space and I think we got good times ahead of us. All right, let's go to the next slide. Look, I'm away this week. I don't have, uh, I didn't have time. I've been uh, Rochester, Minnesota for a few days. 
I didn't have time to uh, put together a presentation on a particular topic, but I do have a few updates that I want to give everybody. So please go to the next slide. Uh, the first company I want to talk about is Sitka, uh, Sitka Gold Corporation. This is one of, one of it's one of our newer investments. Um, you know, times have been tight. We haven't had a lot of money to put towards new stores, but this is one that we cherry picked uh, late last year, and it was based on some results that, they, that came out from work that Sitka did at their RC project in, I think, September of 2023. Okay, a little refresh here. Uh, Sika is exploring a reduced intrusive type gold system. They are up in the tombstone belt in the Yukon, and they are exploring a, a system that is very, very similar to Snow Line Gold's Valley uh, system, the, the deposit discovery. All right, uh, this is a, an intrusive related gold system. So basically, you have uh, a granite body. In this case, we see some uh, kind of scooby lines going across there in pink. That is uh, an expression of an underlying granite body. Those are, are big fat dikes that have come up through the ground uh, and crystallized, uh, but they are closely associated with gold. Okay, and the drilling done to date has defined a very broad, uh, sizable gold resource. But what's really intriguing is uh, late last year they started to hit some very high grade mineralization. Uh, you know, with respect to this type of deposit, they hit. 124 meters of two grams in one hole. And within that, there was uh, 55 meters of three grams, very much like what we see at Snow Lane, in fact. All right, so the, the, the holes that you see in the green, those two green dots, those are holes, the first two holes that were drilled this year, 57 and 58. 57 was drilled first. You can see it was drilled uh, at a fairly steep angle to the northeast. And in 58, uh, the position of 58 is about 70 meters north of 57 and slightly to the east and again it was drilled at an angle uh such that uh, it, it was a fairly steep angle to test the same you know general vicinity of where that high grade was so let's go to the next side and let's look at a cross section all right so here you see hole 58 looks actually not too different than the cross section for hole 57 but you can see it it's gone through uh the upper dike it's gone down, hit a bit of sediment in the greens, and then it goes into the dike again. In fact, they hit a very, very long width uh, of, of that dike, given the angle they were drilling. And you can see that's where the high grade was in hole 47 from last year. That's where that 124 meters of 2 grams was, including the 55 meters of 3 grams. Okay, so we, we're going to give this thing a very, very good test. Once again, it's deeper in the system. I'll be very interested to see what kind of grades come back, uh, particularly because they did see visible gold in some of the veining in this hole. Let's go to the next slide. And here you can see some of the core from that zone. This is within the dike structure itself. So you can see uh, in the core kind of a speckled, a white, white and black speckled rock. That is that granite intrusion. Um, one of the theories that I have is that the the coarse white blobs that you see in that intrusive rock are an indication that we're at the top of a granite mass. Okay, those, those things are called phenocrysts. They're basically crystals that were forming when the magma, magma was molten, and they tend to float up towards the top. So when you see what we call a crowded porphyry, where all of those little crystals are collecting, uh, I get pretty excited. That tells me we're probably at the top of a magma chamber, and and that means that we have a lot of run, runway, a lot of room below us uh, where there could be a very sizable system. In fact, maybe all we're, we've seen to date is the smoke above something much, much bigger. Well, further support comes from the fact that they see visible gold in some of the veining. Okay, the, the kind of linear features, often like gray, maybe somewhat tannish gray in this photograph, that you see are quartz veins that crisscross uh, this core. And the quartz veins, uh, we call them sheeted veins because they're they're very flat, linear features that, that cross the core at fairly regular intervals. A lot of those quartz veins have wee bits of, of gold. You can see in the photograph down here in the lower right-hand side a bit of gold that's a very small particle, but uh, that's very typical of, of this style of gold. We've seen this same style at Snow Line. We've seen it at other deposits, you know, Banyan, Fort Knox, all, all of these uh, deposits have gold of this type. And, and very commonly, we see the gold 
intergrown with a, a sulfide phase. In this case, that little grayish uh, blob that's kind of to the right of the gold particles. Um, that's probably maybe bismuthonite or maybe it is, maybe it's even arsenic pyrite. I don't know, but it's a little bleb of sulfide that occurs with the gold that's very common in these systems. So in my book, that is a typical occurrence of gold in a reduced intrusive type system. This has got, you know, it ticks all the boxes for me. And this has got all the hallmarks of a big reduced intrusive type, intrusive type system. And I think as a, as they explore this thing, especially at depth, I think they're going to see more and more mineralization. All right, let's go to the next slide. And by the way, assays are going to take a few weeks, but hopefully we see them sooner and later. I think, you know, given the the slow, slow, uh, you know, you know, nature of drilling at this point in the commodity cycle, I think these guys should be able to get this core through the lab fairly quickly. So hopefully we see some assays soon. Anyway, this this image shows you the broader um, RC project area. You can see the the saddle stock and then the Iger deposit. You know, between the Black Rock um, or Blackjack deposit and the Iger deposit, there's nearly 1.34 million ounces of gold in in inventory right now. That's uh, you know a, a early stage, lower grade resource, but it's this deeper mineralization. The fact that we're seeing a bigger footprint of this, a very large. Uh, reduced intrusive system here that I think is the most intriguing. I mean, this, this is certainly shaping up to something that could be much larger, and now we know higher grade. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right, one of the, the companies uh, we're very excited about, Hercules, put out some news this week talking about uh, some geophysical works they, they did, uh, geophysical work that they did in, in uh, I think it was done over the winter here, the winter months, basically to look at, uh, you know, this sulfide system, this porphyry, buried porphyry system, and how it responds to electrical surveys. Okay, so when you do an electrical survey, in this case, it's basically uh, what we call induced polarization uh, IP chargeability survey. We're looking at the electrical behavior of the rock in the ground. Okay, uh, often with mineral deposits, there is sulfide present. And the sulfide uh, that is very common in, in almost any ore deposit is uh, pyrite, okay, or iron sulfides. And pyrite, if it's evenly disseminated through a rock, it can it can be quite chargeable. In other words, the little bits of pyrite, as electricity is pumped into the ground, they tend to collect electricity, so they they become charged. You know, think charged like a static balloon almost, but for a brief period, okay. And then the other thing is. If the sulfides are touching one another, in other words, if they're all kind of crowded together and they touch one another, you can develop conductive features. In other words, the electricity can pass from one grain to another and actually pass through the ground. So we're looking at the behavior of both the chargeability and the conductivity within the ground. Okay, uh, now, um, this survey in, in particular, uh, you know, found that there is... Uh, a conductive area which is really intriguing and their interpretation is that this conductive area is an indication there's a sulfide like intense sulfide that might be you know interconnected with one another and therefore you know it's conducting electricity and therefore they they kind of use that or they interpret that as a, a proxy for a, a more intense sulfide um, endowment in that area okay what does that mean it could mean there's higher grade okay we'll see we'll see but uh, we'll talk about that more in here in a second okay um we're also seeing uh, a pretty consistent uh, chargeability throughout a very large volume of rock as well and that's obviously that's telling us there's a big big sulfide system here okay let's dive in and, and talk about some of the details here let's go to the next slide Okay, so in this uh, image, we are looking at chargeability. Okay, again, this is where the minerals, particularly pyrite, are becoming charged. They, they soak up the electricity, they kind of hold it for a moment while the survey is being done. So you can see it's almost like an x-ray in, in a sense of where the sulfides, disseminated sulfides in this case, are located. Okay, so the bright pinks, obviously, that's where there's strong pyrite. And you can see most of the drill holes that were completed last year in 2023. Those are those linear things with the little uh, ticks of blue uh, flagging by them and then orange flagging. So the you know, copper and moly um, values are expressed. 
And you can see most of those drill holes fall within that strong pyrite area. Okay, but that's not necessarily where the copper is. Chalcopyrite doesn't doesn't necessarily charge up like pyrite. Okay, so what they're they're suggesting here is that uh, much of that drilling they did last year was in we'll call it the most intense pyrite area, but not necessarily the most intense chalcopyrite area. They're actually saying that might be outboard from that. Okay, so where it says target corridor, they uh, are interpreting that area where the the chargeability is somewhat less, okay, that, you know, you're seeing reds and oranges rather than pinks. Their interpretation is that is where uh, there might be stronger chalcopyrite, okay? So that's giving some uh, reason for them to, to test out into that region, okay? Uh, now, let's let's kind of pick this apart a bit more. Now, first of all, the, the elevation of the chargeability, that's 800 meters, okay? That's... Uh, with respect to, to sea level, I believe it is in this case. So this is think of this as like a horizontal slice of the ground at a fixed level. Okay, go to the next slide now. Now we're we'll looking at a cross section. Okay, uh, unfortunately the scale, the vertical scale, is not here. But think of the the slice that we just saw, more or less uh, being right about in the middle of this uh, of this image. Okay, this is in cross section view, so we're looking at you know from the side. But that, that horizontal slice uh, is roughly where the middle of this image is. Okay, and what they're saying, uh, this is looking east, by the way. All right, so what they're saying is uh, this area, uh, you know, to the mainly to the, we'll say to the left of these drill holes, the little linear features you see there, they're drill holes. Uh, they think that that is where more, more of the chalcopyrite resides. Okay, so it's kind of in the area where there isn't necessarily as bright a pink. But they, they interpret that to be a sweet spot. So, you know, that's consistent with the vectors and grades that they saw from the drilling, that they are heating up towards the north and northwest. It'll be interesting to see what they come up with. They're, they're planning to put some holes in there, and we might see uh, much higher grades in that area. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, now, uh, now we're looking at... A, an image of conductivity. This is not chargeability. This is how well the rock or the minerals in the rocks in the ground uh, conduct electricity, okay? How, how easily the electricity passes through the rock. And this is at 900 meters elevation. So it's slightly higher uh, than the previous one. But you notice that there's a shift. There's a fundamental shift here. In the previous image, we saw most of the bright pink was towards the middle of the image. In this case, it's shifted. So now the most conductive area is towards the south, okay? And this is, the, the view here is that the reason this is more conductive is that there's a higher uh, endowment of sulfides that makes it, the you know, electricity easier to pass through the rock in this area. Does that necessarily translate to, to mineral, uh, you know, endowment? We don't know. Uh, there's also a magnetic anomaly down here. Uh, by, by the way, magnetite can be, somewhat conductive in in the right conditions, so maybe that's explaining it. But it does suggest there is perhaps more um, conductive minerals, perhaps sulfides in this area. Okay, go to the next slide. And now we can see from this image um, in a 3D rendition here, these basically these blobs that you see, these bluish blobs, are, are areas that are conductive that are, you know, shown in 3D. So they're projected down into the ground. And we can see that they extend well below some of these mineral occurrences at surface. Okay, all of these little uh, names that you see here are various uh, shafts and adits and old mine workings and whatnot. And we can see they're very closely associated with the projection of these conductive features down into the ground. What might it mean? Well, you know, my, my gut says uh, when I see conductive features like this, I think of scarns. Okay, I, I, that's just me. Uh, often magnetite scarns with, um, you know, with, with a fair bit of sulfides, per, hopefully, or mineral sulfides like chalcopyrite and stuff. That might be what we're seeing here. Okay, that's just my gut. That's my gut. Um, it's probably not exactly the same way the company sees it, but I do think uh, that might be an explanation of what we see going here. And that would also explain why this is to the south of what they're interpreting to be the, more the copper core of of a porphyry system to the north. This is more on the fringe. Uh, again, it's going to have to be drilled to figure out what's really going on here, but I think they got a very good uh, tool to work with here in both geophysical sets. So 
Uh, they do have a pretty robust plan coming up there for this year. A lot of money in the bank. This is one of the best cashed up juniors out in the market, and I think they're going to make further big, big discoveries this year. Go to the next slide, please. All right. Uh, this week, Newfound announced some results uh, from actually towards the north end of of their mineral system here on, on this Appleton Fall Quarter corridor. And notice, uh, you know, this box where figure two is, or a point with a green arrow, the results in this news release are way up there in kind of that, that area that almost looks like it's getting, uh, you know, broken by a nutcracker. You've got the Appleton Fault Corridor, but you, you have a, a second fault, and we're going to talk more about that. And in this area where you're seeing uh, these veins, this intense veining with this very high-grade mineralization is right there in you know, in that area where they start to connect. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, here's a close-up of that. So you can see the Glenwood Shear Zone, which is the gray feature uh, towards the northwest or the upper left, uh, is getting closer and closer to the Appleton Fault Corridor, which is the other gray feature that you see kind of going through the middle of the image here. Up towards the north there is where they start to, to really get close to one another. Okay, and it's it's in this area where they're seeing, look at all the red boxes. Those are uh, results from this news release. So, so holes that were announced in this news release uh, from this area where veining is trying to bridge or connect those two structures. And often where you see two structures like that, two principal uh, structures that have a lot of movement on them, try to try to connect with each other. It's, it's usually a zone where there's a lot of breakage in the ground in between, okay? And that can be where you get a lot of mineralization. I think we're starting to see that here. Let's go to the next slide. This is a very complicated image. It's uh, looking at that whole picture in a, a different angle. So we're looking uh, orthogonal, or not orthogonal, we're looking obliquely uh, to the southeast. So now we've got the Glenwood here towards the bottom of this image. The Appleton Fault is above it. All right, but you can see all of these modeled structures, uh, the, the reds and purples and whatnot, and orange uh, you see here. This is where all this drilling uh, took place, and there's a lot of gold through there, a lot of structures. Um, what, what we usually call a situation like this, these are linking structures. They're basically brittle structures that try to connect the two shear zones, the two shear features, in this case, Appleton and Glenwood. Okay, and th these can be places where you get a lot of gold. Okay, and, and one of the things I'd point out is much of this drilling is relatively shallow. Okay, they're seeing this mineralization in shallow depths, but given the data that we saw in the seismic recently and, uh, you know, knowing the nature of these uh, epizonal gold systems, the mineralization could continue downward, and you can see a, a whole bunch more structures as they explore deeper and deeper. You can see a lot of drill holes here and there that have, you know, one-off hit, uh, you know, little pops of reds and oranges and whatnot all over the place. Guess what? There's there's going to be a lot of structure, a lot more structures found in this area over time. I think this could be one of the more perspective uh, zones of discovery here. All right, so uh, good news out of Newfound. Let's go one more slide and talk about inflection. Okay, I haven't talked about inflection for a while. A little refresh, inflection resources is down in New South Wales in Australia. And they've, they've, they've got a super smart uh, team of geologists. They're one of the best exploration teams in the junior exploration industry. And they've managed to pick up a, a very strategic land holding in uh, this Macquarie Arc. This is basically a, a, a trend of rocks in the subsurface uh, that that have a very distinct geophysical signature. You can see that on the right hand image, uh, in this case magnetics. And and this belt of rocks used to be what we call an arc, an island arc or, or a magmatic arc of some sort. Basically, where you had a lot of volcanism, a lot of intrusions coming up, and in this environment you can get porphyry deposits. Okay, you can get in this case copper gold porphyries, and where these rocks outcrop towards the southern part of this image, you you get world class deposits. We we have Cadia, we get North Parks, you get Cowell. I mean, there's some just monster porphyries uh, in this country. But up towards the north, where these guys have staked their ground, 
that area is covered. There's a veneer of sedimentary rocks that blankets the area, and therefore we can see the geophysical expression of the belt, but we cannot see those rocks at surface. All right, so that means you got to use clever techniques, geophysics mainly, to evaluate the subsurface and come up with your targets and refine your drill programs as time goes on so you can, you can drill and make discovery. But we're going to talk about this Duck Creek area, and that green arrow points to approximately where Duck Creek is located in the tenement package. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Before I, I show you the details from their recent work, I'll talk briefly about the target uh, style, what we're trying to find here. Okay, and in this image, you can see a cross-sectional view, a schematic cross-sectional view of a typical uh, porphyry like you would see in the Macquarie Arc. And in this case, you can see they've got that post-mineral sedimentary cover. So there's a blanket, and this brown stuff at the top is basically a blanket of, of sediment that buries up all the rock underneath. It's not really that thick. I don't know why they show the scale bar down here at one kilometer because the, the cover is actually only a few tens of meters thick. Okay, so a little bit out of scale, and I might point that out to them. But, uh, you know, that we're talking about maybe 80, 100 meters, a couple hundred meters at most, something like that thick. It's not a kilometer thick, okay? Uh, and, and also the top of the deposit is not two or three kilometers down. These, these are uh, easier to access than that. They're probably, you know, three, four, 500 meters to, to get to the top of the target. Okay, but the otherwise the schematic's all right. All right, so the, the feature that you see there, the kind of the red, you know, blob coming up that is uh the porphyry mineralization in this case copper gold it's a potassic uh, zone of alteration around a porphyry intrusion a porphyry intrusion simply a magma that came up and likely you know expelled the fluids and generated the copper and gold mineralization all right but it's got kind of a, uh, a cylindrical shape to it it's on the order of a kilometer maybe a bit more wide and it can be several kilometers tall uh, you know, again, it's not as deep as they show in this image, but uh, we'll we'll forgive them for that. Okay, um, but it's it's not easy to find this. Okay, you'd think, gee, you know, that's a big target, a kilometer across. You, surely you could hit that with a hole or two. No, on average, it takes probably 20, 25 holes to find the the sweet spot in a system like this. And how do they do it? Well, because of the cover and, and stuff, they got to use some smarts here. And one of the tools they're using is geophysics. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so in this case, in this news release that came out with this uh, with this week, they they did a survey over this Duck Creek area, and the area of the survey is shown in that shaded gray box on the left hand side there. Um, basically, it, it's an area where the magnetics, which is the the left image. Uh, shows a very distinct pattern of arcuate little blobs, we'll call it, you know, anomalies. Um, but more importantly, now they've got this uh, this survey that basically, it will, we'll call it a, a, a seismic survey, a what we call a passive seismic survey. Um, it, it's a fancy <laughs> word, uh, tomography uh, survey, but uh, it's really just a, a seismic survey. To look at this the speed at which um, waves can pass through, seismic waves can pass through the rock in the subsurface. And this is one of the first times I've seen this used in a very, uh, you know, a, a targeting uh, mode. Okay, so they're actually using, uh, you know, a, a passive seismic noise, like waves traveling through the ground, to look at the speed at which they pass through the rocks in the ground, in the subsurface, below the sediment, and they're looking for areas where the rocks pass through, or sorry, the waves pass through the rock a bit faster, okay? Because the theory is that those are areas where, you know, where the velocity is higher, it, where the um, intrusions would reside, okay? So over here on the right-hand side, you can see the areas that are reds and oranges and whatnot are uh, areas where the seismic waves travel a bit faster. It's a bit hard to interpret, but I think the next image does a better job so let's go to that here you can see a basically a, a horizontal slice uh and again it's only 400 meters rl okay so i don't know why we uh, anyway it's it's not that deep guys it's uh pretty shallow and it's a horizontal slice 
and you can see where they've drilled the holes. Okay, they've got, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven uh, drill holes completed. It just so happens, uh, and those were drilled before this data came back, obviously. Uh, just so happens most of those drill holes test areas where the velocities are not as high as, as you know, you one would hope to see with a porphyry. But now that they have this data, they've got these very discrete, you know, we call it circular features that are very suspicious of being, you know, potentially an intrusive, okay? And they've got those new targets. So each one of those yellow stars, each one of those gold stars, is a target they plan to test. And I think this is a really cool technique uh, to hopefully hone in on the, you know, a, a porphyry price in this area. Again, you can see the scale bar over here, uh, kilometers, um, you know, uh, each one of those things is on the order of a half kilometer, maybe up to a kilometer across, and gives us a reasonable target to test. Why they don't have some of the other, uh, you know, high speed, you know, high velocity areas uh, chosen, I don't don't know. I don't know. I'm probably going to talk to the company here in the not too distant future. But um, right now, I can see what they're they're trying to accomplish, and and they do seem to have some very discreet circular features that are perhaps intrusives that they can now drill test. All right, good science, good team. They're very smart. They're also in bed with Anglo Gold. Anglo is spending most of the money on this project, so uh, the company doesn't have to dilute itself in what has otherwise been a very, very soft market. All right, so I think, again, smart team, smart move to have Anglo Gold spend the money here in an earn-in structure. Um, and I would urge you to look at their, their history of uh, that deal with Anglo Gold uh, to learn more about inflection. All right, so that's it from my end. Hopefully everybody has a good weekend. Uh, gold is looking very strong, very interesting times coming. And I think we're, we're going to see a, a, a long time ahead of us that we're going to have uh, some fun in this exploration space. All right, thank you. All right, that's Quentin there. Um, he was uh, recorded because he's uh, traveling. And so that was from yesterday. Uh, of course, gold exploded this morning. It was it was you know trading above twenty four hundred. Gold stocks were going up, and <laughs> we've had a little bit of pullback here. So typical, right? We've had a big move up, like Tavi was tweeting recently. You know, and you know, we can have pullbacks. It's to be expected. But the the breakout, the new trend, the bull market. I mean, look, this is just like a one percent pullback you know it's it's nothing um and um could pull back a little bit more sure um but the opportunity the macro setup the valuation you know we we have rising inflation we have um look at the the stock market rolling over a little bit here in terms of large cap tech stocks today no you know who was expecting that you know and so things are happening under the surface. It really looks like we're setting up for this great rotation with mega cap tech, frothy valuations, slowing growth. Still some good growth, but it's slowing, especially on the free cash flow, the trending free cash flow that we look at Microsoft and Apple this quarter will be going into negative year over year free cash flow growth. And it's not. It's not just because they're just because they're spending so much on capex. It's also because their operational, their cash flow from operations is slowing because their revenue growth is is slowing. Their margins are coming under pressure. I know there's a lot of hype and excitement about AI, but look at the underlying free cash flow trends. Look at the valuations. I don't think they're sustainable. Um. If you're interested in learning more about our strategies, please reach out to Merrick. I'll just turn it back to you, Tavi, for final comments. Sounds good. No, that was great. Uh, it was great to hear from Quentin as well. Uh, thanks for recording that. And uh, good to hear from Kevin, too. And if you guys have any questions, anything you would like to know more about Prescott or about the what we um, our, our funds are about, I would highly suggest you to talk to Merrick. Uh, in the screen. Uh, we're going to be back next week with another video. And so if you uh, don't subscribe to our channel, please do. So then you can get notified of those of those upcoming uh, presentations. But thanks again for watching and we'll be back next week. Take care.